Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. Um, we are talking about student produced documentaries with uh, guys who like to say they're not experts. Um, anyway, uh, at, <laughs> at Educon down in Philadelphia this uh, weekend before this one, um, I um, met George Mayo in the hallway and, and followed him in the room and went to a wonderful uh, conversation presentation he did about student making student documentaries so we thought we'd have him on tonight um, and I don't know how you guys skyped in or how you had Joel but Joel Malley from Buffalo was with us as well um, these guys will introduce uh, themselves and their work here in a second and Scott Shellhart is uh, gonna help us <laughs> make some uh, show some of the videos as well we hope um, and then Brian um, Pacioni, I think I got that right, Brian. Um, is that close? Pacione, but it's fine. Okay. Close enough. Brian Pacione, okay. Um, it had, had the uh, temerity to propose to my school that we do a video project, which um, uh, it's going to start in April. And uh, we were hooking up this uh, just yesterday and I said hey Brian I had there's some documentary filmmakers uh, or who work with their kids you want to come on our show and he's bold enough to jump in here so you'll introduce yourself as well Brian welcome everybody hi so um, I, I want to uh, send it off to um, maybe George Mayo first and um, you could introduce what the project is that you've been working on a little bit and maybe a little bit about why okay um my name is is george mayo i'm a, i've been teaching for um eight years now uh, middle school the whole time but i'm a language arts teacher but for the last four years i've been teaching a new class in my district there's an offering called lights camera literacy and it's a there's a three different years of the class so i thought last year we would try um to make documentaries um and so we, we had tackled that last year, and it took a lot longer than I thought it would, and it was kind of a big, messy process. But in the end, we kind of finished out with some, 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 some films that were, that were okay. Um, and so we're doing it again this year for the, for the second time. Uh, things are going a little bit better. It's still kind of a big, messy, me, um, me, messy process. But uh, it's um, learned a little, a little bit last year that, that, that we're sort of applying this year. Um, so the reason why we do it is I, I feel like most of the films that we make in, in the class, they're all um, fictional films. We make a lot of um, sort of short scenes, and we do um, this big five-minute uh, film project where they make these short movies. Um, so it was kind of interesting to you know, have them do a different type of film where they're sort of you know, doing some research and, and doing a documentary-style film. It's kind of something different that we hadn't done. Um, what I hope ultimately kind of what my goal is, somebody asked that question when uh, last – Two weeks ago, when, when Joel and I were doing that Educon, uh, they said, "Why do you do the documentaries?" You know, and I think ultimately, I want my students to be able to like be more critical consumers of mass media, and so I feel like one good way of doing one helpful way of doing that is creating media themselves and seeing the power of sort of combining images and video with you know ideas and and how they can be manipulated and sort of um, used um, for persuasion or, or for all, all, all different types of purposes, really. So I'm just kind of like hopefully making them better, more, more critical consumers of media. Uh, and then also at the same time, you know, better researchers and, and more analytical thinkers. Or, uh, you know, collaboration is a big part of the project. So there's a lot of things that go in, into it. There's a lot, of, um, a lot of benefits for making documentaries. But I'd be curious to see what other people have to say about why they do it. I think there's just that's one of the reasons why I do it, because there's just an infinite reasons why you do it. It's just full of all, all types of really rich learning opportunities, I feel like. So it's, even though it's a long, messy process, it's, it's really valuable and, and worth the effort. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, I have a short video that, that we – I have two videos that we can share tonight and talk about. One is one we just finished. It's just a really short sort of teaser um, playing around um, with sort of summary of what their documentary is, is going to be about. And then we have a short – I have a five-minute documentary from last year. I thought we could show maybe like the first two minutes of it to kind of get an idea of what the kids were doing. Um, okay. So I have two little short films that let's, 
let's get the other um, guys in here. Um, we are all guys tonight. Interesting. Anyway, <laughs> um, Joel, jump in and tell us about um, how you got involved with video documentaries or whatever you, however you would define it. Sure. Um, so I have the um, I have the luck to teach this class. It's a senior elective. It's called Mass Media and Film Production. And uh, in that class, I've had a lot of latitude in designing uh, what students do, different projects that students do in that class. And so um, over the course of the years, it has kind of evolved um, as to what we do. Like we've done, you know, music videos in the past. We've done other projects. And then um, last year, I started to see this class was more of a nonfiction creative writing workshop where students would... Um, do several different types of writing, mostly nonfiction, and turn those nonfiction films, or not to turn that nonfiction writing into films. So we do some personal narrative um, that we build up uh, to the documentary project. Um, so that that last year was the first year I kind of structured the class like that. And I mean, one of the reasons is because I think documentaries are, uh, you know, they're extremely uh, sophisticated uh, storytelling uh, genre. Um, if you look at what kids have to do to create a good documentary, be it the research, the writing, the, you know, the digital video composition, these are tough projects. They involve a lot of thinking, um, a lot of decision making, and a lot of design. So I, I, I really like this project, um, these types of projects. And then, you know, I mean, I can't lie to you and say that I haven't also been thinking about the core common standards and what they ask, uh, you know, what they direct people to do in the classroom. And I'm taking a look at the types of writing that they want uh, to happen increasingly towards the latter half of high school. And I'm taking a look at their VAG. I think it's standard number seven about students will use digital media to tell stories or whatever. And I, ca I kind of see it as being a perfect fit, um, allowing my students to tell compelling stories uh, that are well-researched, well-informed. Um, and kind of develop their ability to tell these stories. Uh, last thing is, uh, so this year what I've done is I've kind of structured the entire course around the documentary. We start off like pretty much every film we've, I'm sorry, every film we've made this year has been documentary based. We started off with a film in the beginning of the year where I told them they could only use uh, video and diegetic sound with the video. They couldn't use voiceover narration or interviews or anything like that. I was kind of inspired that Tim Hetherington, the co-director of Estrepo, was killed in Libya, I think it was last year. He made a film called Diary, where he shoots all this footage of, um, you know, all this footage of him being a war photographer. And he streams it together, and he kind of makes a statement about what that life is like, or what that life and experience was like, using only video and diegetic sound. Um, from there, we went to a profile documentary where I told the kids they're only allowed to use an interview uh, and B-roll footage to go along with it. So, kind of like match action, and in order to show what the um, in order to show what the subject was talking about. And we just recently finished a narrative project, which would kind of um, mimic the voiceover uh, type films or type parts of films that uh, a lot of directors choose to use when doing documentaries. So we did those building blocks, building up. And now we're uh, now we're getting deep into the five-minute documentary project, the um, you know, the big the big wazoo, I guess. So that's where we've been so far. That's kind of what what's what's been uh, what's been going on in my classroom. A lot to get in there um, as we go here. Um, I want to get Brian in. Uh, Brian, introduce yourself to us a little bit. You're at Columbia, is that right? But you're working with a, um, a My Block New York City project. Um, and yes. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, well, my name is Brian, and uh, I am a graduate film student at Columbia, but uh, I am the program manager of uh, the education program at My Block NYC. And My Block NYC is basically a really exciting website that uh, I started with a few of my friends, and we were basically. We weren't pleased with the way that New York City uh, was being portrayed in the media, pop in popular culture. We wanted to basically construct a tool that could be used by the citizens of New York City uh, or by people visiting New York City, people thinking of living in New York City, basically a tool 
uh, that could be used to portray the city in uh, a never-ending stream of user-generated videos. And we wanted to organize this footage through an interactive map. So all of you can go to our site. It's www.myblocknyc. And basically what it is, it's a hybrid between Google Maps and YouTube, where you go to the site and you'll see a whole map of the five boroughs, where every single block you can click on, and essentially, when the project is completed, we just went live four months ago, uh, you can click on any block and experience that block in terms of a short documentary or a video moment taken on that block or a portrait of a person who lives on that block. We're also exploring other avenues uh, as far as restaurants, putting videos on the site. It's basically a new way of experiencing New York City told by the people who live and breathe in the city. And I got excited in the project because I saw the potential of this tool to be used in the classroom uh, as a way for young students to learn, not only to learn about their neighborhoods, but to also explore video literacy and learn how to construct a personal narrative. And it's a side of New York City that we don't really see. You know, the skyline and the Statue of Liberty aren't in these student videos. Uh, a lot of these student videos are absolutely breathtaking and have amazed us by the types of things that we're capturing. What we do is we have a camera package that we bring into schools that don't have uh, camera resources or video resources. And we also have a curriculum guide that was developed with the Department of Ed here in New York City. And we basically leave it up to the teacher how they want to incorporate that program into their class. So they can use all of the curriculum guide, which has sample activities, ways of introducing the, the assignment to the class. Or they can pick and choose wherever they want or completely throw it out. We have a math teacher who's using it, who's doing the program who's just having their students do user-generated videos in their neighborhood to study like statistics. And uh, so, so it's a very flexible program. But basically, we give the cameras to these kids. These kids take the cameras home. They bring them on the subways with them. They take them to the parties they go to. They basically have a camera with them for around two weeks. And then they bring all this footage back, and they edit it together, and they upload it onto our map. And like I said, you know, it's not the Statue of Liberty. It's not, you know, the skyline that everyone's familiar with. It's kids reporting about their neighbor who was murdered down the hallway from them in the terrible, horrible housing project that they live in. It's a kid talking about a birthday of his friend or following around his, uh, his older brother who is a soccer player. It's a student saying, my family goes to this supermarket every day or my father has emigrated from Portugal, and this is all about him being, you know, what his feelings were when he first came into New York City, what he does for a living. So it's, we really feel that it's very valuable information. It also, you know, forces a student to basically look at their own lives and say, what I have to say and what I experience every day is special. It is valuable. It is worth something. I have something to say. When I go into classrooms, I ask kids, you know, I say, what bothers you about your everyday life? What do you want to change? And of course, they have, you know, millions of things that bothers that bother them. So I say, make a video about that. We had a video, one kid was, was uh, he didn't like the bullying in his school. So he did a video about bullying. Um, so it's just really interesting dynamic that's created. And it's changed the dynamic between students and teachers as well, where students now feel like, they can show a side of their life that they never even thought that their teacher would see. And it's really strengthened the bond and changed the whole chemistry of a classroom. So Brian, you hit on a lot of issues there. Um, yeah. and, and Joel, I heard you and um, George talking about similar kinds of things, like what, what, how did you come up with topics? Do you guys want to talk about that a little bit? Um, how you guys come up with topics with students, and then maybe hit at some of what Brian's talking there about change of relationships. Um, and we will get to looking at some videos too, perhaps. <laughs> you want me to go, Joe? Yeah, go ahead. yeah, sure, go yeah, whatever. The, um, 
I just think that's amazing what you were describing, Brian. I, the, I love the idea of like giving kids cameras to take home and then just capturing stuff for like two weeks. I mean, that must be, do they edit that when they come back? They do editing? edit it. They do edit it. And it's, it's amazing because, you know, we only have these cameras. We have 10 cameras and we've brought them into the, some of the worst quote, worst schools in the city. And these kids take the cameras home and they always return them. I mean, it's, there's a, there's a beautiful thing where kids really take it seriously. And I think the process of them saying, okay, my life is valuable. People want to hear my story. People, I should let people know what my life is like. Makes them really respect the tool that they've been given. Yeah, just even asking them to, 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 to do that is showing, you know, value or interest in, in their lives yeah. in a really, I think, in a pretty interesting way. Um, let's see. So really quickly, I'll just say we, the way we do topics is we start asking a question kind of like what you would ask students, you know, what is it that bothers you in the world? What is something you would, um, something that you think is unfair, or unjust? What is something you wish you could change? What is something that worries you about the future? What is, um, so just some of these random sort of bigger questions to start um, brainstorming uh, topics. And then from that brainstorming, you know, things sort of sort of start to go from really broad, like, you know, if, if kids, um, if kids say, well, I'm worried about, um, you know, people being mean to animals. So, okay, so what do you, what do you mean exactly? Like, they, they start to kind of whittle that down. And now we have a group doing something on a animal euthanasia. So you kind of start off with these sort of larger topics and slowly, not too slowly. We do this over, of course, about two weeks. You know, they all come down to these. To these, basically, they they narrow it down and they come up with what is a, a guiding question or an essential question that sort of kind of evolves and changes um, as they begin their research. But you know, we try to just um, not rush the topic selection process because it is. I find that it's really a, a, an important step, and that uh, if, if kids are going to stick with the pro with the project over like really what it is is about three months for us. Um, they have to be invested in their topic or and interested, or it just is really uh, becomes really un, un, uh, unpleasant for everybody. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was um, so I, I have seniors, and um, you know, they're, they're you definitely see an interesting side of seniors in my class because you know you expect seniors to kind of cash out early, the whole senioritis thing, but you don't see that so much in, in mass media. And I think it has a lot to do with what Brian was saying, the importance that they see in their own work, um, that they get to go out and tell their stories and that their stories matter. And it carries a lot of social, uh, like cultural, I'm sorry, social currency. Um, I was gonna say that my, um, the topic selection process is much the same. Just this week, um, I had them starting started off brainstorming these questions, uh, brainstorming an, an answers to the questions that, that George was, was was saying and Brian were, was was telling us about. You know, what irks you? What, what's what's an itch you need to scratch? And so on and so forth. So they comprise a list. Uh, the next day, I highlight some of the things that they have on the list, like topics that I know that are you know very narrowed down or very, you know pretty specific. I think would yield yield both interesting research and give them an opportunity opportunity to tell a story that they're that they're interested in telling and, and documenting something that they're interested in documenting and I also of course want to push kids away from you know a lot of times kids will choose the first topic that comes to mind you know the whole oh it's a research paper legalization of marijuana or steroids or you know the go-to things that they always choose um, just making sure that I'm I'm like the executive producer in the classroom if I if I think that a topic um, is being approached for the wrong reasons. I'll have that conversation with students and present that interpretation to them and hopefully convince them otherwise. But <coughs> it's ultimately their project and, um, you know, they're the ones that have to make the movie. It's their film. It's not my film. Brian, any coming around on that in terms of have teachers steered kids toward topics or how to how does that work out? Because it's not you in the classroom, right? Of course. It's the other teachers. No. And it also, I'm wondering if the map idea and all that, if that inspires topics or limits topics or how that works out. <clears throat> sure. Um, well, you know, the first thing that you touched on uh, is about, um, uh, refresh my memory, I just lost my train of thought. Like how, how the teachers you're working with 
steer kids toward topics or away from that's topics right yeah um it's it's completely different you know for every school we work with i mean um we worked you know and each school has a different set of of needs for their students <clears throat> um and a different reason for choosing to participate in the program i think uh, we participated with a school uh, last semester where, uh, you know, every student, their parents were all undocumented citizens and the students really struggled with English and uh, many of them had not even written a very cohesive paper before in their entire lives. So uh, every student basically did a video about their parents coming to this country. Mm -hmm. So we had seven different portraits of um, you know undocumented citizens trying to live in this country what types of jobs did they do how did they get here and you know it's uh, <clears throat> teachers can I come in and I'm basically I'm sort of the uh, like the the person that the kids don't know that now this project becomes serious and they know that they should really try hard because it's not only their teacher who wants them doing it you know um, <laughs> but uh, we really leave it up to the teachers as far as you know what types of projects they want the kids to concentrate on and you know for some schools that need extra assistance I will step in um, sometimes teachers are sort of at a loss because they get the cameras and the kids go out and they don't film anything and they say Brian you know how do we how do I you know they just film their kids like doing backflips in the park and it's just like you know jackass mm -hmm. four or something like that you know mm -hmm. so uh, in that case, I will individually talk to the students and say, you know, what interests you? And when it comes to that level, the results have been really great um, because I pick up little things. We watch at my block, we watch every video and we pick up on little things. And, uh, mm. you know, there is extra guidance available if a teacher needs it. But we've felt and always, you know, and seen based on our experience that the best way is to let the teachers, um, you know, say, decide how the students are going to approach these and I stress this these geographically based videos or these videos that somehow capture the essence of their daily lives in their neighborhood because the whole point of our tool is that the video needs to be located in a map in a specific place so yes the possibilities of what types of videos you can do are endless but also we say that Definitely part of the video needs to be shot outside. Definitely it ne needs to be a nonfiction video. There can't be any scripts. Um, and it must, you know, it, it must be something that, you know, you believe in and you must try and tell a story. I always say, you know, I don't, we don't want to see you. We'll just walk down the block with the video camera and say, this is my block. Great. You know, in one long take. Uh, part of our reason for doing this project and the reason why the DOE has supported us is because and you know uh, George and, and Joel you, you totally touched on this I thought was this concept of video literacy especially the fact that literacy is the name of one of your classes George am I correct right. yeah yeah yep. so different shots mean different things and there's a way to tell a story through you know video and it's just like writing an essay and I always say it's just like writing an essay except you know the your pen is your video camera now you're not, you know, you're not writing an essay with, with, a, with a pencil anymore. You're using your video camera. And as far as, you know, the types of stuff that we get, you know, we get a lot of different types of stuff. We get stuff with a lot of curse words in it. We get stuff that has drugs in it. And, you know, our site will never discriminate against the types of videos we put on. We will accept anything. Uh, but the teacher has the final say to say, this is how I want my school portrayed. You know, and there definitely is, you know, a lot of the process of editing where some things get taken out because, you know, if these kids have these cameras. It gets really, you know, they, they have them with their everyday life. So we see people doing drugs. We see people, you know, cursing, fighting, all this types of stuff. I think it's really what, what, what strikes me is like um, I love the idea that the kids are making documentaries about stuff that's going on in their neighborhood, right? Because then yeah. that, that's kind of would be interesting. I'd be willing to try that um, in a future documentary project instead of doing these sort of national, you know, uh, issues like really getting kids to zero in on their community and yeah. you know going out into their community with cameras. I mean, that would be uh, 
I mean, it would just kind of really change the whole game of what we're kind of doing as far as like the documentaries we're making now. It would be a very different uh, project in some ways. I think it's so interesting though what you were saying about you know choosing these big these big topics. I'm sure you know it 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 definitely stresses the research aspect of the whole process probably. And you know it's interesting because we go to private schools where you know the tuition is fifty thousand dollars a year for a student to go there, and those videos tend to be about like a certain block where they interview people on the block and this is the store that's always been on the block and this is the guy who always hangs outside the store and this is where he comes from blah 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 but the videos that come from uh, schools with lower in with students with uh, you know low income house from low income households uh, those videos tend to be this is my life uh, every day I get up at 5 a.m because I got to catch a bus and this is the bus. Now I'm on the bus. You know what I mean? Oh, look, outside my window, there's 20 cops. I just heard gunshots. I don't know what happened. You know, those videos, it's very interesting to see the different environments create, have these trends for creating different types of videos. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Well, um, George, should we get back to the videos you wanted to show and then bounce off of that? And Brian, I don't yeah. know, I don't know how much longer you can stay with us. Please, as long as yeah, you can. Yeah, I, I could. I would love to see George's videos. I can stay for probably another uh, fifteen more minutes. Okay. Shall we try to do and, that, Scott? Um, and then after George introduces what you were thinking, we might try to show here. Google Hangouts aren't gonna, perfect yet, yeah. but go ahead. <laughs> so we're working on this. If we just, if we could just show one of them and then jump to, to to one of Joel's videos, that would be good. Okay. I think I'd really just like to show one that really short one that's forty-seven seconds, and I can briefly introduce it. What you're going to see, if that's okay. Scott, uh, it's what it, I actually got this idea from Joel, uh, getting kids to sort of create some uh, videos. Um, a, a little video leading up to the, to the actual video they're going to make for the documentary. So what you're going to see, it's like 50 seconds, and it's a group. Now they're about a month into their research, and they made a 60-second video. Basically, I was using this as an opportunity for them to, to play around with Final Cut Pro X, which we just, which we just got that, and to also sort of think about how they're going to put their intro together. And so we're, when we watch these videos in class, we're going to talk about you know, lighting and sound, and then we're going to start to sort of get the groups to brainstorm because you're just going to see a kid talking right to the to the camera, and it's a pretty good little script they put together actually intro, but um, it's just like a, a the foundation for what we're going to start to sort of put on top of it. So they have to sort of think of images and videos and things that will make their video more um, powerful. So you're just going to see kind of the, just the little foundation, the kid reading right to the uh, right to the camera. And another thing we're going to talk about is pacing. He's got a really nice, they, they, they relay some really inf interesting information and they've been going to local animal shelters, but the pacing is really kind of fast. And so that's something else we're going to, so we're kind of using these as sort of a critique of, for when we get, when we do it for real. So these, so. this is happening right now. <laughs> yeah, we just finished this. Like I just exported this little thing today. So they were just kind of wrapped up this little, little one today. They're supposed to have a couple of images in it. But again, it's just, um, you know, it's just like kind of a little teaser and we're just kind of getting ready and, and thinking about some of the things when we actually put the film together. But I think they did a really good job. They, it kind of shows that they've been researching it and, it, and they've thought about the, how they want to, you know, introduce their topic. And so. How are we doing, Scott? We see blank screen. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. I can hear you, yeah. All it's, right, here we go. It's backwards. Oh, hold on. Backwards, huh? Yeah. Yeah, and, and and Scott, I'm not getting anything on, uh, you know, the bigger portion of the screen. It's just black. You, I mean, you I can look at it. On... You will in a second, okay. I think. Okay, is it, is it mirror image correct now? Nope. Still backwards. Hmm. Ah, uh, detail. So you figured I something think we'll, out. We'll be okay. I don't think there's any graphics other than the word that says title. So let's just play it and see what we get. Go for yeah, it. that's all there is. There are about 7 billion people in the world right now. We are running out of space. Are we killing innocent people for more space? This is what we do to animals every day. It's called euthanasia. 
than 7 million dogs and cats are taken in by shelters in the U.S. annually. 3.5 million of those animals are euthanized. The main problem is that healthy and treatable animals are getting euthanized due to the fact that shelters are getting overflowed annually. There are more pets than homeowners. This means that many animals will never find a true home and many will have to be put to sleep forever. So again, it's just kind of the, you know, the, the really early, early, it's a really rough cut of what's going to eventually be their, their intro. Got it. Yeah. So, Joel. And then they would, Go sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Go. No, so, so you do, how, how, how many months of pre-production work do you do before you go into production on the uh, actual project? Well, we, we've been researching for about four weeks now. And for, for this particular group, we do a lot of Skype. We got a lot of experts coming in via Skype, but this particular group is doing, it's a local issue. So they're actually going to two local shelters and talking cool. to them about, about uh, euthanasia. But we do, um, this is where I get kind of tripped up, um, where we, we do a month of research, we have all our interviews, and then we go into the sort of pre-production process. And this is where things get messy for me because I'm not a documentary filmmaker. Uh, and I know I kind of, Joel and I, I try to, you know, at the Educon thing, we're talking about this where we start production, but we're sort of like right now we're outlining, like we we're outlining the, our basic ideas and we're sort of brainstorming images and video. I guess it's kind of a pre-production, you know, doing a little pre-production, but it's, um, I have to wait till the interviews are done and then we kind of start thinking about where we're going to actually film. And production really is just kind of narration, you know, the, we're trying to find some places around the building where we can do narration. And if there's any possibilities of going out and getting interesting B-roll footage, doing that. But um, a lot of it is also pulling in archival footage and, and clips on YouTube uh, that are really relevant. Um, so it's uh, the production process is, is tricky and um, it's something I, I struggle with. You know, planning for it, going into production, it's, a, it's all sort of um, a little bit. I have some gaps in my thinking here a little bit about it. Yeah, but George, I think that like, I don't know, I think it has something to do with the complicated task we're putting our, we're giving our students. It's like, to me, I wish it were cleaner, but it's like writing is a recursive process. It's never, you know, it never follows a logical progression. I mean, kind of, but we're always going back and revising and re-editing. And my kids are always going back and researching right up until the end and reshooting right up until the end. I wish it were cleaner because I'd have less gray hair on my temples. <laughs> but um, it's just, I don't know, it's kind of the nature of the beast, I think. And uh, I, I'm sure that, that, that eighth graders might need a little bit more support like structure uh, in order to help them be successful but I'm finding my kids do too but at the end of the day I'm finding I don't know like a lot of my filmmakers they they start to develop their own process their own kind of habits of mind and it's messy but um, a lot of times it works no, sometimes it's interesting. it doesn't and, yeah. you know it's interesting Joel because yes I stopped and asked the class okay I said okay look we got in what do we, I said, I need your advice, you know, what do we need to do as far as planning now? We need to start getting, because I saw one group spontaneously started basically outlining their project. And they were like, and I said, what do you want from me, you know, to help you guys out? And they said, well, we don't need um, one structure, right? We don't need for you to, to, to give us a mandate on what you're going to do. Basically, they kind of said, just kind of leave us alone and let us plan out our documentaries where we want. You know what I mean? Give us some loose guidelines and some feedback, but kind of get out of our way uh, mm -hmm. to an extent. And I, and I think sometimes that's one of the best things you can do as a teacher is kind of get out of their way, um, you know. So I'm, I kind of was the last two class periods, they've really been working well, and they, they've all sort of got their different plans. Some groups need a little more help, but, um, yeah, it is, I'm – It sounds like, I mean, it, but reading in the middle, you know, Nancy Atwell talking about – working with her with her writers and writing workshop it's not different at all it's like you know some kids you can you, you gotta you, you can let them work for themselves but we're te you know we're the more expert learner we're the more expert filmmaker even if it's only slightly um so we can step in and give solutions and add a, help give added structure to you know those kids that we think are struggling um and it's just, I think it's about conversations and it's about pitches and it's about, uh, you know, meeting, you know, making sure that we talk to our guys and see what they're up to, see what they need. You know, one of the, th one of the things that I heard recently that Sundance does 
is they workshop documentaries. Maybe you guys know about this better than I do, but they it sounded like they were almost almost finished documentaries that they were then that so it's a very competitive process to get workshopped at Sundance. But what they do is they go in, they start all again. They start, right? Um, so that that seemed like an interesting process, and I wonder if that happens a lot in documentaries. You like get something sort of done, and then you begin again, and go back to the original vision, or or now your vision has changed, kind of thing. Like, do kids start over again? Is there enough time to do that? Any thoughts? Um. In, in my experience, there's not enough time. Like one, once we once they begin really pushing into a project, and they've got production, and they got a you know their timeline is building, being built up. I mean, they can certainly make some drastic changes, but as far as like scrapping everything and starting over again, that doesn't. Um, I haven't experienced that. So. Yeah, I mean, I've experienced it. It never works out well. It's always, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's always that group you know can't handle it. Um, and a lot of times it's because they're not invested in their topic. And a lot of times it's because they drag their feet and they don't bring in footage and they don't do all those things that, um, that need to be done. Um, but yeah, I've had, I've had kids. I mean, I had a girl uh, restart a project. It was due Friday, last Friday, this narrative project. And uh, on Thursday she came to me. She's like, I'm com uncomfortable with my footage. I, I can't do this. I've, I've got to start over. I'm like, listen, you've, um, you're really struggling. Your grade is in the tank, and you're struggling with this film. Um, if you're telling me, and what I told her eventually, at the end of the conversation, I said, listen, if you can tell me that you're going to come at this task with a renewed vigor and go out there and do the things you've been telling me you were going to do over the course of the past four weeks, then that's fine. Start over. Let's do it. You know, I won't take many late points off or any at all because I'll forget. Um, and uh, just go make a good movie and make me, you know, happy that I made this decision to kind of bend things for you. I guess. Yeah, there's generally, you know, with our with our program, um, as far as as reshooting, you know, it it actually it, it happens a lot because, um, you know, a, a lot of the times, kids are not really sure and teachers who do the program aren't really sure I mean you guys all sound like you have a very solid wonderful way of introducing to your class so I don't think if you guys did the program you'd have to reshoot with your class but a lot of the teachers we work with have never really done video before in their class so they don't know the value of a pre-production period of planning out and having a plan and of storyboarding and all of this it's it's almost like a run and gun type scenario that we get into a lot. So uh, a lot of time the kids do go out, bring the footage back, try and make sense of it, and then realize, oh, no, my video is really about like the 30 seconds of graffiti footage that I got. And that's the most interesting thing. Okay, I'm going to go out again and, and concentrate uh, on that. Or if, you know, if it's three months after they have the cameras, Sometimes they contact us, the teachers contact us again and say, can we get the cameras again? The kids really need it. And based on the availability, we will give them cameras again because we know, you know, and many of these schools are under-resourced schools or schools that are really struggling to even meet sort of curriculum guidelines and things like this. So we are understanding of that. Um, but it's an interesting process, and especially when uh, our, even though our project is like you must make, a short video about your neighborhood or you know what I mean or about your daily life uh, it is a very open topic and for you guys it sounds like you know it, it's more specific which is great I wish I wish we could you know uh, have it ha have sort of a push in one specific direction but you know we've seen that time and again the best way is to just let the teachers kind of decide what's going on I have a question Scott, go yes. for it. Um, do they have to use your cameras because of they have GPS enabled on them, or can they just shoot with their cell phones, mix different footage together? Of course, uh, no. They they only use our cameras if they need our cameras. We have a lot of we have many schools who have their own cameras uh, that they use, or you know, kids. 
I mean, most people on the website actually upload footage, you know, because the website is open to the public. There's, you know, right now, I don't know, there's like 1,800 videos or so over that right now on the site. So, um, you know, uh, they, can, they can use anything that they want, and they, we don't care about quality of image or, you know, as long as it's like you can hear it and you can see it and it's powerful, then great. <laughs> you know, they can shoot with their iPhone, then shoot with an HD, then shoot with a VHS. We don't care. Shoot with a webcam. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, I want to, and Scott, can you say a little more? You were saying in the chat earlier that um, you're thinking about elementary school. So at any point, some of your, just some of your questions about that, how this would look in an elementary school. Yeah, I, I mean, to, to do it all in a neighborhood or a, a block or a borough, I mean, that, I, I, mean I, I want to go check out the site as soon as we're done here. It sounds really interesting. But to, to do it with, you know, third or fourth grade, you really can't give them a camera and tell them to walk the neighborhood. <clears throat> yeah. I, uh, what's interesting is that we've done it actually a, a class of like kindergarten kids recently did it. And uh, what the teacher did was just take them out on, you know, four separate days. Each kid had like a camera in the class all together concentrated on one block, a block away from the school. They just spent all day taking images, interviewing some people with all together with the teacher there and chaperones there. So it wasn't like they spread out. They used, you know, a half an hour of the class period to go to a, a local place and just concentrate on capturing images in just that one place and kind of created a, a class video of one block. Yeah, and and so, some of this stuff is hilarious, like <laughs> little kids asking people on the street, like, if you could be a monster, what monster would you be? Like, it's just really, really funny stuff that, that, that we got. Yeah. And I could see him doing the whole school building, you know, the first grade hall and the second grade hall and, sure. and then break the building down or, or even up, you know, the other thing I thought was with, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, you know, in a small town, they could do the area around the school or. Definitely. Or even, I, I could see this being scaled like to a chamber of commerce site, you know, here's you know, a little XYZ town out in the middle of nowhere, and they wanted to do a something on their webpage to show off their town, you could make this pro class project or something. Definitely. And, and we, you know, our whole, I guess our whole like mission statement was to give a voice to the voiceless, like the students from low income housing in the city, uh, the, the high school students whose parents are undocumented citizens, uh, basically, so that you know, there's YouTube, I can't go to YouTube and see these types of videos. Uh, even though, you know, YouTube is an amazing thing. Like, there's no place in YouTube where I can easily see uh, videos that are created by people who know the subject that they're, they're like almost experts of, you know, the crosstown bus. The 17 year old is an expert of the crosstown bus. So why not do a video on what you're an expert of? A yeah, cross town I mean, bus, you know. Everybody's an expert in their own life. But. Exactly, exactly, and you know, I have no idea what the cross town bu bus is in the South Bronx. You know what I mean? And so, that's you know that that's the whole reason for us sort of doing that. I, I'm sorry, but I have to I have to run. Thank you, thank uh, you for well, staying not, twenty not, minutes longer than you thought you could. So thank you very much. It's no, it's fine. I I, I had a I had a dinner tonight, and and my friend is in the other room <laughs> making me dinner. I said, oh. You have to wait. I, I, I have to go meet with, with these teachers. Um, thank you so much. But, you know, I encourage you guys, of course, no, thank you so much for having me. I encourage you to check out the site. I, I see that we have someone else. Hi, Monica and Brian. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, Paul, we're so excited to be working with your school especially. Cool. I don't know. You know. Paul has a very, very special school, in my opinion, which is we are really excited for. Uh, cool. And, 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 you know, Joel and, and George, uh, if, if you guys, we, we, once again, we have a curriculum, you know, uh, that, that has, that's 80 pages long, and it's designed for a person who's never taught documentary video ever before. Um, so if you would like that curriculum, you can, of course, reference that curriculum. I can, I can definitely send that to you guys. Um, that sounds great. Yeah, how do I get your email addresses, or, or is there an easy way to do I that? I could type it into the little Google box. You're, <laughs> you're, you're, 
you can just uh, contact each other through Google Plus too, by the way. You're all in a okay. circle together. That's one way. <laughs> Paul, you're a real advocate of this Google Plus. You're no, the only person I really. know. No. <laughs> Do you work for Google? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not yet. Um, anyway. Uh, oh, you know, okay. I had, I had a question, and we can just imagine how Brian would answer this. Um, but um, it's okay. Uh, thanks for stopping. Uh, in a, or staying with okay, us. Okay, okay. I'll... Hey, I'll be five minutes, okay? <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, here's here's the deal. Um, and I, I want to hear George Mayo talk more about um, use of experts because George does this amazing stuff with Skyping in experts into the classroom and how you use experts. But um, I just wanted to ask, and maybe nobody has done this yet, but there are experts in the community too. So I'm just wondering if any, if anybody has done any work with that, like having kids think about who are the elders on your block, who are the important people on your block who, you know, know about your block. And yes, yes, you're an expert, but there are also people who have lived here for a long time. Has there been any kind of interviews with those kinds of experts? Definitely. Definitely, many videos. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. the The thing that I always say to kids, though, is I know. I and this is literally what I say. Like, hi guys. Like, and I give them my whole spiel, and then I say, I know how hard it is to walk up to someone you know and to ask them to be in a video and to ask them questions. I know it's really hard, and it requires you stepping outside your comfort zone, and it's something that I have trouble with as when I make my own films. It's something that even the most famous filmmakers have trouble with when they speak to their actors. It's mm -hmm. scary telling someone what you want and asking someone to participate. Uh, but I say, you know, we're asking you to step outside of your comfort zone a little bit. And if there's one kid who really can't do that, then they sort of turn inward. There's always that option of turning inward and saying, you know, this is me, basically. I, I can be the subject. But I would say that the the, it was def it's definitely probably split half and half between like straight up interviews of like that old guy on the corner who's been there for you know 50 years and you know this is my life these are my friends mm -hmm. this is the view from my window you know it, this is it's like a prison uh, you know we have it's great when they narrate it because they say things they they say things like you know this is this is my window this is my view uh, it's kind of like a prison, you know, they say all these things that are all sort of like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> you know, it's like this normal video until they say something. And then the next shot is like, these are the bullet marks on my front door. Yeah. So, and this is the knife mark along the hallway. My friend did this. It's like, wow. Oh my God. You know, and they think it's just, you know, whatever, but we're mm -hmm. sitting there like, wow, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, I, I really should Thanks. go. Thank you. Thank you again. No, thank you guys. And good so, luck with everything. Yep. And uh, yeah, and I, I and we'll put you in touch with these none. guys again. So, and this will be up okay. on YouTube. So we'll. Okay, great. We'll keep going. Great. So George, later, maybe. Brian. Thank Thanks. you so Thanks, much. Brian. Bye bye. George, thank maybe you, Brian. Ad That's ad great. Talk about how you deal with experts and. All right. Um, well, yeah, that's one of the cool things about this documentary is we are, we are able to Skype in experts. And it's amazing who will get back to you. Like, um, I got a guy coming in next week. He was the first African-American of Baltimore. Uh, his name is Kurt Schmoke. And he's currently the uh, Howard, the, the uh, dean of Howard Law School. And he's going to Skype in and talk to some eighth graders about the drug war next week. He's going to give us 15 minutes of his time. And so you just you email these people or you email their um, assistants or whatever. And it's amazing who will get back to you, and they and they give you uh they give you their time, and we also like we have some local topics. We bring in local people as well. Like last year, we had a professor from the University of Maryland. Just um, Monday this week, we have we're doing the thing on an old auditorium that's in our school that we want to open. There's a big push in our community for years now, and somebody came in to talk about that. We've got a, a councilwoman coming in uh, next week to talk about that topic. So she's going to visit. She lives right behind the school. So yeah, definitely bring in. I mean, my strategy on experts is any way, any any way, any way you can get them. If they're local, great. If they're if they want to be skyped in, 
uh, that's fine as well. But it's really uh, just a great way to, to get students interviews. I, I take a really active role helping them contact these experts. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they help me. It's kind of a group thing. We team up um, as far as finding them. They, oftentimes, the experts are come out of their research. They start to list them on the bottom of the wiki page. They generate questions for these people as they're doing the research. They have some really good questions that come out of the research. But uh, yeah, the, uh, the the Skyping is one of the one of the really fun things. You, Troy Hicks did that po post a couple weeks ago about uh, feminist frequency. It was a video he posted. Uh, Anita Shark Sarkeesian, I think that's her name, but she skyped in. I got a, a group of girls doing um, something on gender stereotypes, and so I sent her an email. Oh yeah, sure. She, she skyped in, you know, a week ago. She was really cool. She's in Los Angeles. I got her. What well, for 8 a.m. was for her was apparently really early, and she was ready to go. Uh, and so we, um, it's a really, it's a, it's pretty cool. I and mean, it's all these really, uh, I'm amazed how people give the are willing to give up some of their time to Skype in to talk. So, mm -hmm. fun. Joel, that sounds really good. I, I, I just, um, that was one of my takeaways from from your from your presentation at Educon is, um, just that possibility. And I'm going to try to encourage my students to try to support them to do that. Because a lot of times, what happens, I mean, I've had students go out and find experts. Like I had a kid who did a film last year about um, Buffalo and um, its rejuvenation. And so they went and they found like this local civic leader and they did an interview with them, which was kind of cool. So I've had instances of that, but not to the extent that I would like. Um, a lot of times our experts become teachers at the school who are available. So the science teacher becomes the global warming expert. And, um, you know, as much as we can encourage kids A, to make things at, uh, with increasing levels of professionalism, but also put that them in that opportunity where they have to speak with knowledgeable people. I mean, how powerful is that, that, that yeah. this kid, this eighth grade kid can sit down and ask questions of this, this just smart, awesome person? Yeah, I mean, it's That's a really awesome. great, you know, real world opportunity for them. And they're on their own running around. I got class at the same time and they're having to do it. It's not me. I'm not with them sort of hovering around, you know, it's like they're having to pull it off. But th this year I, I did a little Twitter account for a documentary project and just thinking maybe, maybe it will work and it's been really useful. You know, I, um, for some people you want to email, but some people you just send it uh, Twitter and it's like, you know, that's been a good way of really quickly getting, 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 uh, getting uh, in contact with people. I've been pretty happy with that. So. Joel, do you have something queued up there? Joel, sorry. I meant Scott. Yeah, this was the next next video on the list we wanted to play. I'll just have it ready whenever you are. Shall we look at a little bit of it? Let's see what happens. So, um, quickly, George, do you want to introduce this? Oh, this is Joel's video. This is Joel's. Yeah, this, this oh, is one of mine. Joel, go ahead. Sure. So, so this was uh, this was the second. This we, this project was done last year. A kid named Taylor. Uh, second film he ever made, um, and it was the, 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 the assignment was to go out and make a profile about his person you find interesting. Uh, so this is what he came up with. This is, uh, this is the, the, the fruit of his efforts. Where'd that assignment come from? That was his idea or talking through um, it like together? The, the, the interesting person or the person he chose? Yeah. Like, so... Whatever. The, the 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 overall assignment was was my assignment. Um, I I can't remember you know how I, I mean it was it was not a novel idea just profile person you know, um, mm -hmm. but I wanted them to find somebody who's like like that that, that they found interesting. I'm kind of talking in circles, uh, and kids did a lot of different things. Like I had a kid interview his uh, his. Um, you know, accordion playing grandfather. So I had some kid uh, interview, do a profile on his grandfather owns a shop. Some people did their friends and their cool cars, just some aspect that's interesting about somebody and tell that story about that little topic that they do or whatever they do that's interesting. That's how that came about. Roll it, Scott. <laughs> okay, here we go. skateboarding four years ago. I blew the cheek to water. I was doing it. So I said, what the hell? I like skateboarding because it's fun. I 
I don't really have anything else to do. <clears throat> Games. My favorite tricks I am kick flips, aerial flips, like one eighties, big big spins, maybe big big flips. Those are cool too. The type of skateboarding I'm doing is like street skating, which is finding random areas in the city, skateboarding on stairs. the credits man it's the really credits are really nice You know what? It's um, kid made that movie, and every time I watch it, I can't help but think that uh, yeah, the kid who made that movie was the only one in that film not to drop out. So hmm. he graduated. The other two guys didn't make it, and um, so just constantly thinking about how are we not reaching these kids? How are we not um, making them see the value in school and how are we not giving them the tools to tell their stories? And I think it's part of it. Um, you know, those kids were disengaged kids who were in that film. Um, I think there's some sort of connection there to be made. I'm not too sure. The little major skills right there. With it. I mean, that's really uh, impressive what they pulled off with that, you know. They, they, they fly very well. Okay, uh, <laughs> not sure where to go next with that. So, sorry to be a Debbie Downer. No, no. I, but say say a little more. Like, what do you think? What I mean, you, you're saying you're you're able to give them some tools to tell their I'm, stories. I'm saying those yeah. those those two kids they they left away be, well before they got to me, um, and I'm just wondering how much that has to do with the way we fail to, uh, that you know, that high schools fail to incite them to do stuff that they care about. I mean, why would a kid drop out of high school? I mean, um, obviously, they're having a hard time making the connection between the relevance of what they're doing um, in the real world. Um, actually, that one kid who is not really in the film, but he's in the credits. He, he used to sit in my class. He would never do a thing. He wasn't in my, he wasn't in my mass media class. He was in one of my younger classes, my English 10 class. And I can't, I'd say he wouldn't do a thing, but that's not entirely accurate. He would read his manga. He would read this thing or that thing or the other thing. He's always reading, but he was never doing what we were doing. And I'd have many, 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 many heart to heart talks, just trying to get him to, you know, somewhat play the game of school. I don't know. And um, I was never really successful with him doing that. But I think that the class that he was in, you know, we didn't do a lot of this type of thing. And I'm not saying that this type of thing would have helped him walk the stage or whatever. But I just don't think there's enough of what we do in the class. There's not enough of this valuing the student uh, in schools. I just don't think there's enough valuing the student as creator and teaching them how to tell compelling stories using these types of tools. I think it's a... It's a transformative thing from what I've seen, and it needs to be more widespread, I guess. 
is my point. Thank you. And thanks for sharing all that. Monica, that relates to some of what's cooking up for next week, does it not? Do you want to kind of int introduce you know, that I, at all? Or I, do don't, I don't know for sure what it is. They included me on this Twitter stream, and um, mm -hmm. I wasn't even there when it was happening. I know that it has to do with engagement of kids in high school and dropping out. and. Um, I apologize for coming late. I had some other meetings, and I apologize for not knowing more about um, what you guys are all doing. Joel, are you connected with Brian? Are, are, are the three of you guys working together on no. something, or is this three different things? Or not We're yet. Just three lost souls swimming <laughs> in a fishbowl. Yeah, not yet. Well, I have to say, I mean, I, I absolutely love it, and I'm I'm going to go look you all up. Um, I I think. What you were just talking about, Joel, I think one of the keys is um, valuing, valuing them enough for them to feel like they are the experts. I mean, that kid is obviously more of an expert than me on a skateboard, right? He's obviously more of an expert than me on, you know, getting some of that video down. Um, and I, I think that's, that's where we have to start, you know. I, I just finished a book, and it was talking about... Um, the, the quality that's really helpful in, in moving things forward is not feeling like you have to prove yourself. And I think that's done more damage than anything, feeling like you have to prove yourself by standards that, you know, as a kid or as a parent, you don't even believe in. So I'm, I'm absolutely loving what, I'm glad I came, imposed on you all and came at the last minute, but I'm really glad that I did because it's looking really good. So I'm glad you could make it. <laughs> so it yeah. sounds like next week, yeah, you're right, Paul. Probably a continuation of how do we engage, how do we engage kids? And um, I liked what um, Brian had to say. It's to me, it's about getting outside of that those walls. You know, mm. it's it's not how do we engage them in the classroom. It's how do we set them free, um, and they have their natural engagement inside them that we need to unleash. So I'm hoping that's where the conversation's headed next week. Some amazing people will be talking. So. Mm. And George, thank you for coming by. Do you have any last thoughts? There's so much more that we wanted to get to, but um, I mean, scripting and all of that and so forth, but good conversation. But do you have any kind of last thoughts as we end here tonight? I'll start with you. Uh, I, well, I kind of agree with what Joel was talking about, how there, I think, um, using film can, can be really engaging for students. And it's, it, it's kind of unfortunate that we don't do it more in the schools. I mean, I, I see it could easily be um, used in, across the curriculum, I think. Um, so, I mean, it, it would be, it's, it's weird why we're not doing that. Cause it's just, it is really engaging. If you use it in, in, in the right way, I mean, it can be a waste of time, but it can be also a really engaging thing. And it just seems like a, a common sense to start outfitting schools with more, more media and digital video editing equipment, you know, in science and social studies or just across the board. It's, I mean, it, it does allow kids to create stuff and to, to show what they've learned through through creating something that they care about, through creating something authentic. And I think so it's a really, huge way they communicate, you know. It's, it's a, di a different media, and that's how they communicate a lot of them the best right now. But yeah, Paul. Thanks for ha thanks for having me on. It's, I'm always uh, it's been interesting. So, what, it. one of the other issues we didn't get to, but I'll just mark it is um, is also how it changed. We mentioned it a little bit, but how it changes the relationship between the teacher and the student too. So using these things change a lot of you know using video. <laughs> um, turns us into what you guys talk about being producers in the classroom, which is a different kind of uh, situation. Is that somewhat true? Totally, totally true. Yeah. It's, um, <clears throat> I spend very little time in front of my classroom. Most of the time in my classroom, I spend next to somebody, taking a look over their shoulder, you know, hand on their chair, checking out uh, what they're doing, giving feedback. And I think that, um, I'm more of a partner and I think that's that, that that's that's really that's really I mean that's how that's how good relationships are formed uh, meeting the student at the point of need and um, you know having a an active interest in their success and letting them know that 
I don't mean to drag us into a longer conversation. <laughs> Just wanted to identify that. Thank you. Um, do you have any last thoughts, um, Joel? Thank you for coming on. Today. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. I think this was a, it was a great conversation. And uh, George, I want to thank you for helping me get involved in the conversation originally. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to talk about these things and, and, and the things that are going on in our classroom. So thanks for that opportunity to help tell, tell that story. Other than that, I have no final thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, guys, uh, for letting us uh, be here with you in these conversations. Um, uh, Scott, you and I should get together sometime, and we should work out the sound. I want the sound to get better. It'd be great if we could watch videos together um, on here. And um, when uh, Joel and George, when you got your students this semester have finished stuff, It'd be great to have them come back on here and like show their stuff off. And by then, we'll we'll have it really good, and we'll be able to show it and have some time together. But uh, Scott, th thanks for awesome. starting us off here. Yeah, it, it worked. That wasn't the best, but it functioned. But that's that's how we learn. Yeah. Okay. We'll have to work on that. Thank you. Um, and um, do want to say that uh, we've been broadcasting here over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network, and that's at edtechtalk.com um, and worldbridges.net. And as you heard, we'll be talking about um, high school and success and dropping out and numbers. And uh, it's wonderful that there's a group mm. that is uh, pushing Monica and myself to talk about these issues. So we're looking forward to meeting up with all those folks next week. <laughs> talk to you. Bye now. All right. See you guys later. See you, see you later.